So you're you're with the American Kratom Association, uh, Mac, I, uh, as I understand it, right? That's correct. I'm the senior fellow on public policy for the American Kratom Association. We call it, we call ourselves the AKA. Yeah. I, uh, a couple of days ago, I took a brief look at it, and I'm going to actually pull it up here right now as well. Uh, and it's basically a, a consumer a kratom advocacy group. Is that correct? That's correct. We represent the uh, estimated uh, 11 to 15 million kratom consumers in the United States. And uh, I, I guess, as you know, uh, my videos has, have created some uh, controversy and uh, quite a bit of lash back out there. And I guess that's how you found me. How did that all come about? Can you tell me how we came here today? Absolutely. We have a very active advocacy community. Uh, they, they look hard at any Kratom criticism. And I think some of the comments that you made were classified by those individuals as being somewhat critical. Uh, they asked me to reach out to you to see if we could have a dialogue uh, to, with the hope of expanding the understanding about this plan. Sure, sure. Um, I don't have any particular uh, takeoff point. Uh, I'm more than happy if you do have one and you want to start the discussion uh, or I can come up with one. It's completely up to you. I'll let you uh, drive the seat right now. Well, let me launch uh, just with a description briefly of how we got here. Uh, in 2016, the Food and Drug Administration made a recommendation to the Drug Enforcement Administration to schedule two of the alkaloids that are contained in the Kratom plant called metrogenine and 7 hydroxy metrogenine on the premise that these were schedulable uh, alkaloids that were dangerous, highly addictive, and that were uh, posed a danger to the American public. Uh, the, the DEA initially uh, accepted the recommendation, which they routinely do, by the way. Uh, it is supposed to be uh, premised on a very rigorous scientific uh, review of published literature and evidence uh, with, that proves each of the, the points that are made by the FDA. Uh, after the scheduling notice was published, uh, there was an outcry from the public. More than 140,000 people signed a petition on the whitehouse.gov website there were more than 6,000 commenters that directly contacted the Drug Enforcement Administration, even though there was no formal comment period at that point. And there were more than 50 members of Congress who reached out and said, don't schedule it, and 13 members of the United States Senate. Pretty balanced philosophically, by the way. There were uh, 25 uh, Democrats and 26 Republicans in the House. And on the Senate side, you had then uh, Senator Orrin Hatch from Utah, who was arguably one of the most conservative members, of the Senate. And on the other side of the spectrum, you had Bernie Sanders, who of course is one of the more liberal members of the Senate. But they all agreed that the decision made by the FDA to schedule Kratom was wrong. And as we have examined, and as the Drug Enforcement Administration also examined, the evidence that was presented, they found it to be wanting. And that's why the DEA withdrew uh, its scheduling recommendation, unprecedented action, by the way. And then the FDA submitted a second uh, uh, eight-factor analysis, which is a full uh, review of Kratom. That was submitted on November 17th of 2017, three years ago. And typically, the DEA will act within 90 days if there truly is an ever-present danger to the public from any substance. But I think in the intervening time period, the FDA's position has been so discredited that it, it now is laughable when it comes to the science and to the policy that they are advocating. And uh, if I can ask you, uh, in your own words, what is the FDA position on this stuff, that it has no medical value and a high potential for abuse? Because that would be, I think it was Schedule 1 they wanted to put it as, right? That's correct. And so it was their obligation, their burden of proof, to demonstrate that, in fact, there was a high addiction liability and that it was going to get people addicted. And that it posed this, uh, this danger, and that in fact was, has no approved medical use. Well, that's the FDA's nonsensical position, which is, by the way, a carryover of exactly what they tried to do against dietary supplements and vitamins in the early 90s. If you'll recall, their position at the time were that dietary supplements and vitamins were killing consumers, and that they needed to be banned and brought into the new drug application process. By the way, they were partially correct. 
It was true in an unregulated marketplace, there were adulterated dietary supplement products and vitamins that posed a danger and did result in some deaths. But those were adulterated products and it has not been the policy in the United States to use adulteration of any product as the basis for scheduling it or restricting its access to consumers the law provides for corrective action to be taken by the FDA to make sure that those adulterators are removed from the marketplace and that their activities are interdicted by the law. The FDA has chosen to go on the same kind of attack on Kratom in 2016 as they tried to do in, in 1994, and Congress reacted appropriately with the passage of the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act, called the Deshaies Act, which the FDA hates, uh, if it were up to them, they would repeal that law today. Fortunately, it's not up to them, but they're doing the very same thing against Kratom today. Their case in prosecuting the standards under the Controlled Substances Act does not hold water. And they should be, they should be smacked down for it. And by the way, they have been, both by the Congress, by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, and by the inaction of the Drug Enforcement Administration. If they were right, Kratom would be scheduled today because it's been exhaustively studied uh, for years now. And the truth is that Kratom offers a real potential benefit and it is safe in its natural form for consumers to use. All right. So uh, there's uh, some things that were going to be misaligned here. And uh, here's what it is if people think. So, you know, many people oftentimes uh, criticize me wrongly on, the, uh, on my social media uh, by accusing me uh, of being in the pockets of the pharmaceutical companies uh, or being sort of in some ways part of the establishment. Uh, for better or for worse, that's the last thing I am. Uh, uh, whether it's the drug companies, when I was professor of emergency medicine, uh, I was the guy hated by all residents uh, and the faculty because I absolutely would not let the antibiotic companies bring breakfast. I'm like, you're going to spend a whole lifetime in nonsense. So no, if you need breakfast, I'll buy it. As far as the uh, uh, FDA, well, not that so much the FDA to some extent, but scheduling in DEA, I absolutely in no way, shape or form uh, agree with how this all comes about. Uh, so, uh, uh, having said that, I can tell you this, uh, the idea, uh, and I'm trying to answer everything you said in a few things. So, uh, in fact, in terms of public policy in the United States, one of my major criticisms is this, which applies to everything else we do in the United States. Public policy uh, and its implementation uh, is very interesting here. It is absolutely in no way, shape or form driven by critical thinking or what I call evidence, real scientific evidence. So it's all nonsense to me and sometimes they hit, sometimes they miss. Having said that, I apply that same standard to everything, including the dietary supplement industry, which I believe is a $40 billion a year industry, which is really no different than the big pharma that everyone criticize it, criticizes. Going back to Kratom, uh, let me say uh, uh, from what you can see clinically and what you can see pharmacologically, uh, I will say this, and I'm glad I have an opportunity to say, the idea that this stuff potentially has no therapeutic benefit is insane. Because all you got to do is look at the pharmacology of this stuff and what it does and how it's traditionally been used. It absolutely has therapeutic benefit. So if you want to put it on schedule one, uh, uh, which includes uh, marijuana, heroin, all that other stuff, LSD, uh, uh, it's insane because uh, uh, one of the things the scheduling does, <clears throat> it's driven not only by this kind of ratio of uh, medical use versus abuse potential, but it's also driven by culture. If we look back on the war on drugs, uh, 
and how these certain things are super dangerous and they're going to kill you. I mean, we're going back all the way to the 70s in some ways. You know, to schedule marijuana as a Schedule One drug at that time, I actually might disagree. Today's marijuana is ludicrous. So, uh, you know, their scheduling is nonsense to me. And if you put something like Kratom as a Schedule One drug, it's going to go against everything that I advocate and believe in uh, with all of this stuff, in particular in Kratom, there should absolutely be studies. Having said that, let me go back to uh, what you said uh, regarding uh, the scientific evidence. Uh, there is more and more and more and more research on Kratom. Uh, there's been a lot of bench research on Kratom. Uh, the last few years, there appears to be more uh, solid uh, well-designed studies at the clinical level on Kratom, both in uh, Western countries and in some of the countries indigenous to Kratom. And some of these studies aren't even based on their public health and outcome studies. But I don't think uh, when I refer to data and studies, we do not have the information needed. Uh, I do believe we have information to instigate further studies and evaluation. But what we call scientific or clinical evidence to be utilized within the medical setting, it's not just, it just isn't there. We don't have the numbers and the data. Uh, but I absolutely believe that it has therapeutic value and it should be utilized so that we can do the research to get there. Um, uh, thus far, that's, you know, I, I want to say some of that stuff about what you said. Uh, and I think Kratom, for the most part, has fallen under the same trap of consumption and a sort of corporate capitalistic uh, 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 mechanism of bringing things to the market and misinformation for consumers, uh, uh, as everything else has. Uh, 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 so, uh, but nevertheless, Kratom the natural product, uh, it should absolutely be studied. And I think it probably definitely has value for pain and maybe for some things like anxiety and maybe at the right doses for stimulant use. That's my major issue is that the way it is passed out right now, uh, it can cause harm and it does cause harm. And the other issue is this, uh, it does have potential abuse. Uh, and I see it all the time. Uh, uh, does that, uh, you know, if you turn around and say, well, so does uh, codeine, uh, I, I agree. And it should be dished out in the right way by a clinician who knows what they're doing. But that's all gone to crap now as well. But to the idea that this stuff has no potential abuse and can do no harm because we actually don't know everything about it in the way that it's manufactured and handed out to people, minus the issue of adulterants, uh, it can be dangerous. And I think the case reports and case series and what we call anecdotal evidence is piling up. And finally, uh, I uh, do hear people saying about how Kratom saved her life and how well they're doing. Uh, what I have to say about that is this. Uh, number one, if you, you've been using it for six months, uh, give me a call in five years. Number two, uh, individual case reports, even if it's my sister sitting in front of me, once I detach myself from su subjective statistical biases of it being my sister or myself, uh, these individual reports are by formal definition called anecdotes. And they mean nothing until metadata is presented. So somewhere in the line of that, you have law enforcement, uh, Congress's position, which sort of doesn't, uh, for me, doesn't add up to much, whether they're pro or against. Uh, and you have some people fighting for this stuff and some people adamantly against it. But in that thin layer in between, there is therapeutic benefit and a lot more research needs to be done uh, and we need to leave the way open for that research instead of putting it on a scheduled one drug 
uh, and and then we can exp explore the potential benefit. And those are my thoughts in general on Kratom. Um, so so we would we I would agree with you entirely that Kratom is not a candidate for scheduling for a variety of reasons. Uh, I think I would respectfully disagree with the premise, however, of what you've expressed with regard to Kratom. Uh, if you approach it as saying that it is a therapeutic agent as opposed to its proper characterization, which is that it's a food. And when you look at the research that has been done, even long-term use of Kratom at very high doses in Southeast Asia, the studies are conclusive that there's been no long-term chronic uh, disease issues or, or, or danger issues to the consumers. Uh, now, I get it that there are anecdotal reports, but if we're going to weigh anecdotal reports that are given about kratom consumption and dependence that can, in fact, uh, occur with, uh, you know, high dose, long-term use of kratom, I concur with that. Uh, that's different than addiction, by the way. And you look at the anecdotal reports that are piling up, and I'll, I'll go head to head on any of these, the number of people who express the benefit that comes from specific use of pure kratom in, in, in terms of harm reduction. And as a physician, I know you would agree that we should adopt a policy that has harm reduction at its core. And what we're facing in the United States today is, and, and but for COVID, the most significant public health crisis we face are the drug overdoses that are killing tens of thousands of Americans. And when you look at the Johns Hopkins survey that was peer reviewed and published earlier this year, they looked at adult Kratom users, those that were specifically using it for acute and chronic pain management, and they found that 87% of those people reported that they had a significant reduction in withdrawal symptoms from the, uh, the drugs, the opioids that they were using. And of those, 35% were opioid free within a year by using Kratom. That should be the trigger for the FDA to say, let's study it. It certainly was the trigger for the, the National Institutes on Drug Abuse to do exactly that. In fact, when NIDA first looked at and the challenge that we placed before the FDA about their alleged deaths that were caused by Kratom, which they retreated to associated by Kratom, our analysis found and, and NIDA corroborated it independently, that those deaths were caused by poly drug use. Not surprising that someone might be using Kratom as they struggled with opioid use and found a better alternative. So in the midst of their coming off of opioids and transitioning to using Kratom for the management of acute and chronic pain, not surprising at all that they'd be doing that. They also found, and they examined closely, the addiction liability, because that's the, that's the mother load when it comes to trying to, it, characterize Kratom as a dangerous drug. It does it have an addiction liability that's significant. So NIDA funded two independent concurrently run animal studies, which in the dietary supplement field, as you know, is the gold standard. And both of those studies, peer reviewed and published within two weeks of one another in June and July of 2018, came to two conclusions. One was there was no significant addiction liability. So that undermines the FDA's claims and it's why NIDA abandoned their support for the scheduling. The second conclusion they found from those animal studies that they observed in the test animals a significant reduction in the craving for the reference drug, which in one case was morphine, the other was methamphetamines. That is significant. And that's why NIDA is now funding uh, millions of dollars in studies about Kratom. They have approximately $15 million in studies out and they have a pipeline of additional studies that they are going to fund as they determine that they have a secure supply of pure Kratom that they can reliably uh, have available during the, the uh, term of a three to five year study. The this, this science now is overwhelming. You look at Dr. McCurdy's research that has been published, even the most recent one just a week and a half ago, that showed that the use of Kratom tea was a significant, had no addiction liability and was a significant uh, pain reducer when it came as an alternative to opioids. You look at Dr. Henningfield's research that says your chances and risks of overdosing on opioids versus Kratom, you have a thousand times plus greater risk of opioid overdose than you ever would on Kratom. So the FDA's premise that it is a, a, an unapproved drug is wrong. It is a food that is dose dependent in terms of the beneficial impacts. I have, I have been in China 
and, and visited the universities where they commit a huge amount of research into the value of and the medicinal effects of plants. And Kratom, of course, falls into that. Most of our modern medicine is premised on what they do in China in terms of that research. And then, of course, they extrapolate from that and produce chemical versions and synthesized versions, versions of those plant uh, molecules or alkaloids into new drug applications. I get that. And that may be the future for Kratom, by the way. There's already one such uh, new drug application that's in preparation for a synthesized version of the Kratom's alkaloids. But we do not regulate foods based on a fear-mongering campaign that the FDA has, has launched starting in 2016, but really it began in 2009. And that's when the trigger event occurred. Nine deaths in a 12-month period in Sweden from one product that was bought on the internet called Krypton, which was a powdered Kratom product. Every public health official in the world appropriately and rightly looked at that and said, we've got to do something. It resulted in some countries banning it. In the United States, the FDA does not have that authority. So they imposed an import alert and then they engaged in a disinformation campaign that has not served the public very well. That disinformation campaign came out and said, it is a, da is a dangerous product. They ignored, and by the way, they have an obligation to, to actually to look at all science they ignored a peer-reviewed published article in 2011 by Swedish scientists who looked at those nine deaths. Every one of them was, was a death that was a result of an adulterant added to that Kratom product called O-desmethyltramadol. In the dose that it was present in that Kratom product, if you would put that same dose in your cup of coffee in the morning or a glass of orange juice, you would be dead within hours. But no one, not even at the FDA, would ever advocate that we would ban coffee because it was adulterated with a dangerous substance or orange juice. Yet they lommed on to Kratom to do exactly that. Now, obviously, Kratom was emerging as a, uh, as a product that was being consumed by American consumers for their health and well-being. They have choices and freedoms to do that. The FDA wanted to stop that. I get it. I get their bias. I know they're biased against dietary supplements and plants, herbs, and all of that. I get it. That doesn't make it right. And the FDA has been proven wrong time after time in this area. They are magnificent in most things, but they have this bias that has been deeply embedded that is going to continue to prosecute their disinformation campaign against Kratom, despite the overwhelming evidence that we ought to do harm reduction. Let's, let's find the appropriate dose level. Let's find the safe way to do it. And by the way, we're now seeing even human trials that are being developed that are, are the preliminary results show that Kratom is safe and that it's effective. Why, why the FDA chooses to ignore that, I don't know. But I, I have hope because Commissioner Hahn said a fascinating thing uh, and at the, uh, the National Association of State Agriculture Commissions meeting in February, he was addressing uh, CBD. He mentioned how he'd walked off the plane at Reagan National Airport out in the concourse, and the first thing he saw was a huge display for CBD products. It is illegal to sell CBD in the nation's capital in all 50 states because the FDA has chosen to make it illegal. Now, he, he made that point and he said, but it would be a fool's errand, his word, a fool's errand to try to, to ban CBD or to stop consumers from consuming it. He said, we should find a good uh, a regulatory mechanism and inform them. That's what we want for Kratom. That's exactly the position. And that's why four states have passed the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, which does what the FDA should be doing. Make sure the products are properly formulated. Make sure that they're not adulterated. No synthesization of the alkaloids. No, uh, no uh, departure from good manufacturing practices. And every product is properly labeled. That's what the FDA ought to be doing, and they refuse to do it, but the states are stepping into the breach. And were it not for COVID, we would probably have 20 states today that would have that law in effect. We expect in 2021, we'll get to those 20 states very rapidly as legislators step into the breach that's been created by the FDA. The FDA is wrong on the science, and they're wrong on the policy on Kratom. They just won't admit it. The first point that she did make was uh, that uh, agreeing with me about it not being on the uh, scheduled set of drugs. Uh, I didn't say that. What I said is should not be scheduled one. Uh, and the reason is uh, for two reasons. It absolutely appears from, again, I'm going to call it anecdotal medicine. It's a very specific scientific term. And there is plenty of anecdotal uh, evidence as in addition to uh, 
a whole bunch of clinical evidence that it has very robust medicinal value, but uh, the idea that this doesn't have an abuse potential is, uh, uh, I think it's short of ludicrous uh, because uh, it absolutely does. And uh, we're- just me, I just, I told you the two studies, the HEMBI study right. and the U study, both funded by the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, both concluded that there was no significant, significant abuse potential. And you look at the, the uh, McCurdy study, which corroborates that, all funded by your tax dollars. Now, I get it that there are people who say, and, and, and you happen to be among them, that Kratom has this huge addiction liability. It is I, 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 didn't, I didn't say huge. Okay, um, as an addiction liability, it is schedulable. No, not even, that's not the term I use. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually cut us down into the way I communicate because okay. this, is where, uh, this is where the devils and the details and formal discussions matter. Uh, uh, I didn't say addiction liability either. Abuse potential, which is a technical term, and I left it just as that. In fact, if you want to talk about that, I'm going to use gabapentin as an example for you. A guy who's 63 years old with severe uh, peripheral neuropathy, secondary to diabetes that's been uncontrolled for 25 years, and he's on 2,200 milligrams of gabapentin for that severe neuropathic pain, uh, and 2,200 milligrams. And if I get on my channel and talk about the abuse of gabapentin, I try to make it very clear. Uh, something that occurs in one type of doctor's office versus another medical setting is very different and you can't extrapolate one set of uh, clinical engagements and data to the other. And so Kratom uh, potentially uh, maybe, because we don't know yet, can be said the same thing about it. Within the substance abuse community of patients, it might have a much higher abuse potential than, let's say, if you and I were going to use it for pain. The devil is in the details, and in these discussions, a lot of these get missed. So, A, it does have an abuse potential. To what extent and how much? I don't know, but I know that, uh, you know, I've seen probably about 20 cases of them, which is quite a lot. And some of these are really bad guys and uh, you guys having a really hard time. So that's one thing. And then from that point on, you, I, I, I'm happy to go through, through every point you made because uh, it sounds convincing, uh, but I think it's, uh, I have an obligation to uh, give feedback on every comment that you made about, well, this study did. Okay. This. I, I hope you keep an open mind that I sound convincing because it's true. And I'll give uh, you an example. Uh, you suggest, uh, you, you suggested that there is a significant abuse liability to Kratom. No, I suggest that there's an abuse liability. Okay. And what I'm telling you is that based on the science that has been concluded, in the, in the sphere of scientific research that looks specifically at that issue, uh, they found that there isn't one. There isn't a significant addiction liability or abuse potential. And I so, will address that science. Is, so I won't leave you hanging. I'm gonna address to you the actual interpretation of that science and what that means. Uh, it's, it's certainly not meant to extrapolate and disseminate this stuff. It's a couple, it's three studies. I've looked at one or two of them. These are animal studies. I think the one I looked at was, and from that study, nobody, no real formal thinking scientist that's gonna disseminate this stuff to the world. Uh, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night knowing what I know and how I approach things mm -hmm. to take that study from the greatest university on the planet and say, Kratom has no abuse potential and then add to it for any type of person and then add to it the way it is disseminated to the consumer right now. I'd be going- okay, then no, one, no one would use anything. I mean, you, you, you've imposed a standard that is now impossible. Actually, no, that's how we, no. no. Well, let me finish uh, on that topic. Uh, uh, yeah, you got to So I, I'm going to break this down and go through everything. So on that topic, that is not how we approach things. And uh, that is not how we make those decisions. And you're right. We goof up a lot. In fact, the history of medicine is, uh, is uh, just, uh, you know, screenshot after screenshot of wrong decisions.
And in fact, I can tell you about medications right now that we use. For example, everyone in this country is on a statin, okay? I personally wouldn't give statin to a dead dog, right? Uh, I used to use statin as a way to teach statistical evaluation of how these things make it to the market. But to use what's out there, and again, this would be a six-month discussion on talking about the value of those three studies in making the extrapolation that this stuff has no abuse potential that actually is not how it's done. Because I'm honestly telling you, it has from anecdotal data and from clinical, uh, kind of just looking at the pharmacology of it, it has great potentially therapeutic potential. I'm really honest. You probably, I'm pathologically honest. At the same time, I don't leap from that to say, I'm gonna take that capsule from uh, somebody that has uh, uh, gone through uh, American Kratom Association's uh, uh, stamp of approval with a third party uh, person that uh, says, hey, your processes are great. You could have the best processes in making crack cocaine. That doesn't make the stuff uh, you know, good to consume. I think there's a lot of con, and, we, and you know, I think we could spend three hours and I can go over every one of your points. If Jimmy wants to, you can rewind it. I could write it down about, takes me about five minutes and go through every point you made. But uh, my point, and each one would be 45 minutes. The conclusions drawn are skipping five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 steps uh, uh, of each one. I'm telling, I might be crazy, uh, uh, but I can tell you, uh, I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if I became a national spokesperson and said, hey, that, that, that stuff shows from three animal studies, one of these studies from uh, Hopkins, that this stuff didn't have abuse potential. Uh, now I can go into the details of that. Uh, and that's just one of the things. So uh, that, that wasn't what the study from Hopkins said. No, I'm just saying I was using Hopkins as an example as a great university that, uh, right. uh, you yeah. know. Here's the problem. Here's the bottom line. If you, if you want to believe that Kratom is a drug, then you're right. We need to have more studies about it, and we, we need to do a lot more. If you believe that it is a food, which is its proper classification, given its, its content and its structure, and its pharmacologic effect, then you should treat it that way. And then the burden of proof comes on what are the limits? What are the proper limits for a person to ingest this food where it would then convert into potentially a, a, a product of concern for which there ought to be some guardrails put into place? We're open to that discussion. We, there are many foods that if you, if you take too much of something, it can harm you or it can benefit you as well. But we would look for things that harm us. The FDA took the premise that it was an unapproved drug, and they claimed that there were 44 deaths associated with, and any person, any person sitting out there, including yourself, would say, that's the anecdotal evidence that tells me that I should be very careful about Kratom. That is why you have some police departments who say it's bad, you have some medical examiners who say it's bad, but when you look at those 44 deaths, every one of them, and we did, we pulled every one of the, uh, the through a FOIA, all of the reports, there was only one that we couldn't get good, accurate data on, and that's because the FDA redacted it, claiming that the family had, had imposed a HIPAA vi a regulation on it, so we couldn't see it. So uh, 43 of those deaths, all of them, every single one was because of, because of poly drug use or an adulterated Kratom product or an underlying health condition. But you, if you're looking at it in aggregate, you could say, oh, well, this is anecdotal evidence that proves that it must be dangerous. No, that's no not when we looked at no. it, it wasn't. And guess who else looked at it? The National Institutes on Drug Abuse. And yeah. they came to the very same conclusion. And by the way, do you know what happened with the one? And this is the thing that ought to raise the red flag for every American. We, we were denied access to that one autopsy based on the allegation uh, that the FDA said the family had imposed a HIPAA restriction. A reporter at, was looking at a completely different story at the FDA on a completely different uh, section of the FDA. And they found the completely unredacted uh, autopsy report on this individual. They fo they foiled it and they got it. There was no HIPAA restriction. Do you know why the FDA didn't want us to see it? Because when you looked at the autopsy report, it was true that the individual was using some, uh, some illicit drugs. And it was also true that he had consumed Kratom in approximate uh, time of his death. 
the cause of death were two gunshot wounds to the chest. How can anyone, how can anyone- I'm gonna slow you, I'm- There's any credibility to yeah. what the FBI is trying to do in prosecuting its war on freedom. And you shouldn't get sucked into it, nor should any other American. So I don't. So I'm going to slow you down. And first, I'm going to propose, in all fairness to you, that whole section where you spoke and I didn't respond except to the first two things, um, I'll give you a choice. Uh, I'm either going to take it out because I didn't get to respond to each one, uh, or I can go back, uh, look at it, and then respond to each one and then paste it all together. So that's one thing. The other thing moving forward, uh, uh, and this is a high operate because I actually don't get sucked into anything. Every comment you make, uh, I'd, I'd like uh, an opportunity to that one thing because there's a whole bunch of things built up that sound like a solid argument. They're not. Uh, because right now I want to say we have two things that we're discussing right now. Uh, kratom of food versus a drug. And then the second one at the autopsy reports. So uh, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to slow down and really dig into everything you say, if you're, if you're okay with that, because uh, 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 every single one of these things has been looked at. Uh, so I'll let you think about me going back and uh, reviewing the questions, but right now the food drug. Uh, l let me ask you, uh, you made a comment, uh, that pr you brought on a new premise and you introduced a concept into the discussion of, hey, we also need to consider this. Is this a food or a drug? And somehow that takes some sort of importance in driving the overall point that this is safe and it should only be under this type of regulation versus that more stringent type. And obviously being a food would make it so. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, 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 why is it so? So for me, I couldn't care less if it's a liquid, a food, something you call drug. By the way, drug has uh, two definitions. Uh, uh, one of them is used uh, in terms of anything that has medicinal value. The second colloquial definition of drug in the modern sense is illicit drugs, cocaine, heroin, this, that. That's how we use those two, that word in the natural language. Uh, uh, so if you're going to choose, uh, uh, just so you know, you can look it up in Webster's. If you choose to shy away from uh, uh, calling it a drug and you want to move towards using the food concept, which to me appears it has a lot of benefits for you in promoting your position, you're going to have to categorically give up. If this is an important distinction for you, you're going to have to categorically give up the benefits of designating something in natural language as a drug. Because I do. Now, I do. And then I then the Kratom has no uh, medicinal values and the advocacy is uh, based on nothing. No, no, you have, you have to put this in context, Dr. B. The only reason that we're having this discussion is because the FDA decided to bastardize the definition of Kratom for their own regulatory purposes. Under the statute, no, not just- not, under, no, not, no, not. Under, Listen, let me finish. Under the statute, they have no authority to regulate foods and they know it. So what they did is they mischaracterized Kratom as a drug. It pharmacologically doesn't have the, the, the kind of effects that Dr. Dr. Gottlieb stood before the American people and said, Kratom is an opioid because it hits a mu opioid receptor in the brain. Well, so does cheese, chocolate, St. John's wort, many other things. It is a partial agonist at its best has no effect on the respiratory system in any significant way. There are many, many substances and foods that act on the opioid receptors, but it was to the FDA's benefit to characterize it, and in this case, mischaracterize it as a drug so that they could try to take regulatory actions. I wasn't defining it as a food for some convenient reason. The FDA mischaracterized it as a drug for their own regulatory purposes to expand their authority, which the statute, not Webster's, the statute does not give them the authority to, to do. That's our point. Now, there is an open discussion about the appropriate use of Kratom, and we are open to that. We think that like many other foods and, and other kinds of dietary supplements, you can misuse them. And we think you should not be allowed to do that. And there ought to be appropriate research, done, research studies done. And the FDA should have an appropriate regulatory role. 
I'm not saying that it should just be allowed to do whatever, you know, whatever people want to do. In fact, I advocate strongly that we should regulate this industry very carefully and make sure that you're not adulterating the alkaloids or creating a dangerous product. I'm all in favor of that. But do not, do not tell me that the Webster's definition protects the FDA. They deliberately misled the American public in order to use the statute to their benefit, and they had to mischaracterize Kratom completely to get to that point. Webster's Dictionary, so you uh, moved away from my point. Number one, I, I'm not having this discussion because of the FDA. Uh, you're uh, saying what the FDA did in 2015 is what has generated the debate, controversy, and misinformation. I couldn't care less what the FDA said. Uh, I kind of look at uh, something much broader than that. As I told you, public policy is not, for the most part, oftentimes driven by formal thinking. So this discussion is not about FBA, Congress, the President of the United States. It's about Kratom, a plant species. Now, uh, 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 you also made an assumption in this discussion and just kind of glossed over it that, hey, beef, and it makes it seem like, hey, this stuff was thought of as a food before. And the FDA took that, looked at it, made it a drug. Nope, that's not true. I got data going back 20, 30, 40, 50 years. No one's ever talked about, hey, I'm going to look. In fact, that in indigenous areas, everyone knows it's a psychoactive substance. Now, if you call it food, drug, oil, I couldn't care less. It's a completely uh, misguided and confusing concept to introduce into this discussion. I know you you're wrong. wrong. You're absolutely wrong. I, I've been to Indonesia. And China. I, it's, I'm glad to. If you look at the studies that come out of Indonesia and Thailand, and by the way, this is why Thailand is now decriminalizing Kratom. It's because of the concoctions that people have made because Kratom doesn't do for you what drugs do. So they have to mix it with something. And sure, anytime you mix a, a, a product like Kratom with something that's more powerful in order to get a bigger effect. And that's what's happening. I don't disagree. That's not Kratom. That's an adulterated product. And that's what's happening in Southeast Asia. There are studies, which I'd be glad to send to you, that have been done about long-term high, high dose uses of Kratom in Indonesia and Thailand. And there have been no adverse effects, no deaths and no significant adverse effects in terms of uh, the uh, mental health of the individuals or their physical health. Now, there are plenty of examples of where Kratom has been mixed with an adulterant that's dangerous, and that creates a problem. I'm all for regulating that, not a problem. But it mischaracterizes the science to suggest that there is science out of Southeast Asia that says that Kratom cannot be viewed as a food, which it is, because people are mixing it into a cocktail to make uh, very dangerous substances. And by the way, that's what happened in the United States. In the early, mid-90s, people saw the Kratom, some of these vendors in the, uh, in this, the amateur chemists, I call them, said, oh, if we start mixing Kratom in with some of these other substances, we can get a bigger market. The reason that there are adulterants in Kratom products today, demonstrated by the 2016 Leidiger study, saying many commercial products are adulterated, is because these, these uh, unscrupulous vendors no, the Kratom itself doesn't give you a high, doesn't give you that reinforcing euph euphoric, euphoric effect. It doesn't do anything for you other than the, what natural Kratom would do, which isn't enough. So they spike it with adulterants. Now, they don't intend to kill people. They just want to make more money. So you think you're buying a pure Kratom product, and man, you feel a buzz, and you say, wow, I want to go back and get more of that. That's an adulterated Kratom product. It should be banned. But the science is clear in this area that pure Kratom, unadulterated, is not going to hurt you. It's not going to be dangerous. And it's not what the FDA says it is. And it's not clear. So again, uh, I'm sorry, Mac. You're throwing in uh, six, seven, eight, nine different concepts into uh, one for me. I, I, don't, uh, I don't think that way. I don't operate that way. Each, almost every sentence you say uh, needs a careful look. Uh, going back uh, to food or drug, uh, it becomes a, an unnecessary introduction into the debate. Uh, it's uh, been used as a spice. It's been mixed with this. 
it, it's not fair and it's not right. Okay. Well, it's, it is fair and it's, it's incorrect. And I don't mean to, to cast aspersions on you and your conclusions on this as you've done with me. I don't and have any conclusions. What is not fair here is to just dismiss out of hand the proper characterization of Kratom being a food. Because if you understand that premise and, and accept the concept behind it, the question is, where do the problems occur? When you as an emergency room physician saw a patient come in and say, oh, I, I'm taking Kratom and I'm feeling this, you know, whatever the physical effect is, that obviously is a problem. There are only a couple of things that could be true about that. Either he's ingested too much of Kratom, you know, obviously an overdose of Kratom, or he's got an adulterated Kratom product, which is very likely, or he's mixed it with some other drug that he's taking, which has an adverse effect that uh, is common. And that's how we, we identify those kinds of adverse events and, and contraindications in the dietary supplement field by identifying those kinds of things. But to say that a person will show up with Kratom only, pure Kratom, and say, oh, well, I'm seeing all these horrible things. It just isn't supported by the science. That's all. And I, the proper characterization of Kratom as a food is essential to the discussion. Why is it, again, why is it essential to the discussion? And again, you said 12 different things. Uh, in fact, I, I, uh, you know, I'm slow, so we're going to have to break it down. I, I do want an opportunity. Every claim you make, Mac, I want an opportunity to respond uh, uh, to that claim. Uh, and uh, this food thing is absolutely non-contributory to the effects of this substance. Nor do I uh, care about uh, long-term studies about long-term effects on Kratom in an indigenous population in Southeast Asia. I'll tell you why. It's something cultural anthropologists know, physical anthropologists know, and uh, yeah, you know, uh, people in different fields know. Uh, it's completely irrelevant to me the effects of Kratom, well, to a great extent, it's absolutely irrelevant to me what the effects of Kratom are within the indigenous population, within the culture that it's used in terms of its toxic or abuse potential. Why? Take a look at cocaine. If you open a textbook before crack and uh, more uh, you know, highly addictive stimulants, cocaine was considered the most abusive substance in Western countries. Okay, it still kind of is. It's highly, I'm sorry, most addictive substance. Okay, guys that are indigenous to where they grow coca leaves have been using it for thousands of years without, with very minimal substance abuse issues. There's a reason for that, Mac, okay? You can't extrapolate that, which is what I was telling you here about this stuff here. You cannot just casually extrapolate any population, even if it's 60 or over versus 18 to 24. So much for telling me about how it's used there. What does that tell me though? It tells me, hey, this stuff should be used for research. If you look at all of the indigenous population, uh, uh, kind of uh, both uh, cultural and uh, clinical kind of evaluation, this stuff is used for pain. It's also used for energy, okay? I'd say that's pretty close to some sort of therapeutic medical effect. Call it food if you like, okay? That well, well, Dr. P, with respect, you're the one that brought up Southeast Asia as a defense against my argument. And you said all these studies are showing that it has all these adverse effects. Listen, you can't have it both ways. No, uh, I didn't. You no. No. Use no, no, some no. Studies in no, order no, to no. discredit what no. I'm saying. No, I'm going to answer you, Matt. You're going to have to stop. So, I, no, do no, I'm going to ask you, please, uh, do not extrapolate and put, I'm very specific with my uh, words. Uh, I didn't say, I, no, I'm very, something is either categorical or it adds to the body of evidence. I, I just also told you in the same way that I told you, even in those areas, there is uh, data showing that there is abuse. I also just said to you that right now that in those areas, given the fact that there's no, uh, not too much abuse potential in general, and there is, uh, there is abuse, but not so much, uh, that is an invitation to further study. So I, I please, Mac, uh, uh, I spent six years uh, studying, uh, uh, my background is uh, uh, mathematics and language, uh, semantics and all that stuff. And I've carried that on to any kind of career I've taken. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm a big fan of Orwell. So uh, I'm very, when it comes to uh, how it's gonna affect human lives, uh, 
I stand strongly against uh, never being misinterpreted and having an opportunity to clarify and promote critical thinking. I want to, so uh, we can leave that. I want to move to the autopsy stuff. You brought uh, it, uh, thoughts about the autopsy. And in fact, uh, I often look at some of these autopsies on Kratom. They're right online. It's, uh, they're, just, they're published. And uh, 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 it's not me that's making a collective comment on it. I, I would say it's the uh, Kratom advocates and, and people that respond to me and say, nothing's been attributed to pure Kratom. So the adulterated Kratom, absolutely. Let's throw that out the uh, door and it should not be, you know, that brings a whole new complication. But to simply say polypharmacy, that means nothing. I'm going to tell you right now, from a purely academic critical formal eye, uh, the argument that this is attributed, and this goes right to the heart of what you got, your position, and I apologize, I don't mean any offense, but you know, it needs to be called out. To simply respond to me and say I'm full of it because uh, uh, because I did make those comments on on my YouTube that you know there's debts are piling up and they are piling up, but to say let's just take this one issue, uh, it's either an adulterant. Okay, let's throw those out. Uh, mostly it's polypharmacy. Absolutely, you're right. And then thirdly, very few pure kratom. You're absolutely right. But the very fact that it's polypharmacy, that means so much more than the Kratom community is making it to be. And I have a, uh, there's 40 of those uh, right in front of me, 200 pages, and I've reviewed every single one of them uh, over the last few years. And I can read one of them to you and go through in detail and tell you why this young man or that, I pulled up three, uh, the young man's polypharmacy overdose is makes Kratom absolutely concerning as a drug that can cause toxicity and overdose and how a toxicologist and a clinician looks at it. Would you like me to go over one case? Well, before you do that, let me tell you from the Centers for Disease Control, which is hardly a fan of Kratom, they looked at the deaths that were associated with Kratom use in their report. I'll be glad to send you the report. They said there were 151 deaths that had that medical examiners, not the CDC, medical examiners reported had metrogenine in the tox screen of the decedent. Then they had a, another death that was associated with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, they had, they, they had deaths that were associated with kratom consumption with polydrug use. After they sorted it all out, they said that there were, I think, seven deaths, seven that were kratom only. That's in the CDC report. What the CDC then reported was that of those seven, now remember, they started 151, they got down to seven, uh, by the way, over an extended period of time, statistical significance, as you know, in the research world is very important. Of the seven, they then applied a more sophisticated analytical tool and the equipment that was used by the medical examiners, and they found in all but one, all but one of those cases, it was actually multiple drugs involved, polydrug use or underlying health conditions, and there was only one, only one that the CDC was able to identify that could not be Kratom, you know, could, couldn't be anything else, but there was no blood work to determine it. So if you look at statistical significance, I get it that we can look and we ought to, by the way, every death is tragic. We ought to look at every death. And I, I look at these, these autopsy reports on a regular basis because I want to know the truth of it too. But what, what you're saying right now have anything to do with the point I made uh, about take your, that autopsy report and what I said. So this is where I want to get. Now. So I made a comment and I uh, made a few comments. I made a comment and I said, uh, let's forget adulterants. Fine. Let's throw that out. Uh, let's even forget the ones that are uh, purely kratom. Okay. There's very few and there might be more and hasn't been published yet. I even said that. Then I said, let's look at this polypharmacy evaluation that can't necessarily be attributed to Kratom. From there, you moved on to, uh, uh, you uh, told me a whole bunch of stats and used the term CDC and uh, a whole bunch of stuff in there. And my question is, how does that address, and you stopped me from continuing, uh, it's a little bit of diversion. This becomes uh, actually a, 
uh, uh, so, sort of a thing in uh, uh, logic here uh, instead of uh, evaluating formal discussion. Uh, and so I want to know uh, how does that have anything to do with what I said except move away from it, what you just said. Because well, I mean, if I understood you correctly, you were saying that you wanted to look at a autopsy report where it was reported that the decedent had kratom in their system. Nope. Uh, uh, that, that's actually, uh, that actually uh, is a diversion from uh, what my point was. Well, then tell me your point because we were talking about autopsies and whether or not kratom is a part of it. And, and I, I hear this argument all the time. And with respect, Dr. B, I'll give you one example. A, well, you a don't know what my argument is. You didn't actually, uh, I said it very clearly. And so you're assuming, so my, my, my argument was what I was going to discuss uh, was very clear. I was going to respond to an argument made from the Kratom community. And uh, 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 you went up. Huh? Which, which was, hey, these are all polypharmacy, so it's BS that they're saying Kratom. And I said, okay, let's throw, a in fact, I gave you a, a point here. I said, you're right. There's not too many that can be attributed solely to Kratom. In fact, 70 uh, MG or whatever it's called, that's the most sort of toxic, potent part of Kratom versus the uh, the uh, the other one, and uh, that one has less abuse and addiction and euphoria potential. We haven't even discussed those things. But uh, I said, let's look at this issue of, hey, these are all polypharmacy. And let me point out to you that why just saying that does not put you guys in a safe place that Kratom shouldn't be looked at with extensive studies or some regulation. That was my question. So I never said, uh, let's look at uh, how Kratom caused death. It's very specific uh, discussion and, uh, and very specific words I choose. <clears throat> I said the concept that you guys say uh, these things are not attributable uh, to Kratom, it was polypharmacy. My point was that's a bogus argument in not looking at Kratom closely and regulating it and doing further studies. And, well, no, wait, no, wait, no, Dr. B, that now, now we're off into the, into the internet here. The reason that we have these discussions is twofold. One is we want to know the truth about Kratom. And I told you very clearly, I favor more studies. I think we need to look at... Well, why don't you let me look at this issue that... But let, me, let me finish. Well, but the, uh, we talk about regulation. There's only, one, there's only one reason why we're having a discussion about regulating Kratom. It's because of the Food and Drug Administration and their attempts to demonize Kratom and to mischaracterize it. Why as did they do that? Drug so that it can be scheduled and regulated. I'm all for appropriate levels of regulation. I really am. So I'm all for protecting the American public from adulterated Kratom products or, and this is important, from uh, altered Kratom products of the natural alkaloids. Metrogenine, you're absolutely right. Metrogenine is the prevalent, 66% of the, of the Kratom plant naturally has metrogenine and less than 2% is 7-hydroxymetrogenine. All that tells us is nature got it right. The plant is great. If, if you have a higher level of 7-hydroxymetrogenine, which you correctly said is the far more powerful and potentially more dangerous component of Kratom, if it's higher than 2%, then I'm all for regulating it. But in its natural state, it never gets above 2%. And in that formulation that nature did, it, it, it doesn't have a significant impact of any kind, a negative impact rather, on the person that's using Kratom. If it's synthesized and elevated above that 2%, I agree with you entirely. Okay, but I'm not talking about it either. So Mac, I'm a, I guess uh, I'm gonna go back to what I was talking about. Uh, so again, I'm not uh, concerned FDA regulation, uh, how they do it. Uh, I believe it needs to be regulated and much more studies. Uh, that we know and we're on the same page as that. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is I'm going to go over one of the essential arguments that I get. Those were polypharmacy deaths. And I can go through one case, if you want, and tell you why that argument's bogus. And I'm going to look at a polypharmacy death. Uh, and that's what I want to do, if, if you'd like to do that. Sure, let's do that. Show me the death. Matt, can you, can you see where I'm scrolling up and down? I can. Yeah, uh, there's uh, 200 pages of reports, and I've always saved this on here but this is one and i almost picked it randomly about five minutes before you came that's uh the how how much how little effort i need uh to uh point my thing out 
But this is a case report. And uh, again, keep in mind, I'm not a pathologist, but uh, you know, my background and training is uh, quite wide range and I'm well versed and I have a good understanding of uh, uh, a lot of these that is, uh, you know, at least at some superficial, well, a little bit more than that, because I would you do you, I, I would be testifying all the time in different kinds of things. But in this case, this is a 24 uh, year old male, and he had uh, some Benadryl in there. Uh, he also had uh, 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 Remron, Mirtazapine in there. Uh, and uh, this is what he was on. And uh, he also had some Effexor and he had some Kratom. Now, as far as the toxic dosing of Kratom in the body, it would be a nonsensical comment in a post-mortem toxicology report. In fact, a post-mortem toxicology report, even though that science and forensics has extensively evolved over many years, I can tell you right now, a key to medical evaluation is history of present illness and physical exam. Well, there is no history of present illness with any laboratory finding on a post-mortem thing. So your history is what was going on in the past to the best you can gather. So again, maybe out of this, I can share with you the extensive amount of thinking that goes behind just saying, oh, they were polypharmacy or how I approach things, okay? So there is no history. It's postmortem. And if you look at things like confidence interval, intervals and uh, uh, value of evaluation of looking at these things, uh, it's an area of high debate. But so we do know it had Kratom in there. We don't have any toxic levels that we have validated for Kratom. And we know there's effects are in there, okay? So, and Benadryl. Uh, no alcohol uh, over here and so on. And it goes on to describe uh, that it's from the U.S. Uh, 2004, actually almost 2015, and some article, fatality, case report, post-mortem concentrations, okay? And again, that's an interesting area of discussion with the nerdy uh, pathologists, uh, and I'm not one or smart enough to have that discussion with them, but it's very interesting. 24-year-old uh, male, it is of importance and significance to know where the substance came from, whether it was peripheral blood, central blood from the heart, or the urine, and how many hours after the death. Just so you know, there's a lot that these guys go behind this thing. Uh, and uh, and uh, so we do know that in the peripheral blood, which would be here versus central blood, uh, and that matters because it doesn't matter just because I'm using a big word. It matters because it really tells you about the history and the value of that level you have gotten. And so we know that in that peripheral blood, there was Kratom, there was Benadryl, Effexor, Mirtazapine, and some alcohol. And there was also vomitus, okay, around the bed, uh, which could really uh, uh, point to a lot of things. He might have choked on his own vomit in the right lung and so on. Uh, he was cold, unresponsive. Uh, but what's interesting here <clears throat> is uh, I want you to remember pulmonary congestion and moderate urinary retention. These start to strike at me because almost every kratom-associated death has moderate urinary retention. That's odd, right? It starts to clue you in in these cases, which we call anecdote, that something's weird about that. Uh, it was reported as a mixed drug Just a moment. intoxication, but for whatever reason, this pathologist decided, and he's not an idiot, decided to call this primarily the leading player in this mixed drug was Kratom, and he says that, and he has no skin in the game, I assure you, okay? No, no, I don't know that that's true. I'm familiar with this case. This decedent had a medical history that was significant for alcohol abuse and depression. He had been drinking alcohol since he was 15 years old. So let me go over it in my way, because it's, it's my time right now to let right now, yeah, now, I'm just telling you that you said that there was no dog in the fight. Let me, let me tell you clearly, the FDA has made it. Has no, made I'm not it. talking about the FDA. Okay. Well, 
I'm talking about a pathologist that did this evaluation, and I'd like the opportunity to go through this case to give it through through my eyes and why uh, the argument that this polypharmacy thing is bogus. Uh, can I do that? Well, you, the, the, I've got the same report. I've been through this. Well, I understand not, that, I, and you're wrong in your conclusion. Yeah, but I just told you, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, you are an expert on public policy. I'm an expert in uh, clinical evaluation, unless if you think that uh, there's no value in me getting into the nitty gritty of these major national arguments that you guys make. And here's one, you know, you, got, you rattled off a lot of things and uh, I haven't had a chance to, and this is how I'm gonna go through each one. And this is what I do with everything in the world. Uh, <clears throat> that's why I think I'm pretty good at what I do at the ground level. So Dr. Have... B, I get it. Let, let me just tell you two points and then you can go through as many as you want. Number one, NIDA looked at the same case and they came to the same conclusion it was polydrug use. Secondly, to suggest that, the, that in this case, the medical examiner didn't have a dog in the fight. That is not, that is not a, a fact that you can say. Example, case in point, medical examiner in Idaho reported one of the cases that I hope you have a copy of that was reported as a, uh, as a uh, I, I heard rest, you say all that. With hypothermia. Yeah. And the FDA called him, called him and said, we want you to change your autopsy conclusion to be death by metrogenine intoxication. And he refused. And he did so because it wasn't the reason. Now, I don't know how many medical examiners have been called and strong-armed by the FDA to say to alter a medical report after they had drawn a conclusion. But the real issue here is what was the role that metrogenine played in a death? You don't know, I don't know, NIDA didn't know, and the FDA didn't know. You have the conclusion of a, of a uh, obviously a, a, a toxic or forensic toxicologist looking at this who conducted and said, this is my assessment. And now we can look behind it. And that's why I said this kid had long-term alcohol abuse, had suicide attempts, was hospitalized because of, because of these problems. I get it. This person had struggles. And to suggest that metrogenine, we don't know what a toxic dose of metrogenine is. And you know why we don't know? We haven't I'm found gonna, it yet. I'm going to stop you. You're not going to let me do what I do, huh? Because, <laughs> I, look, I, I am 50 years old and I've been... Uh, uh, you know, I like a saying by Malcolm X, uh, I'm going to stand against injustice uh, wherever it comes from, whoever it comes from. Uh, and I've done that my whole life, whether it's family members or somebody I'm supposed to. And that's why I get in trouble. Now, uh, I, I, uh, you're wrong about most of what you just said. Again, you didn't stop it. You made major claims and uh, I could have answered each one of them. And they kind of go into this wind of, uh, that's why I would never be a good uh, national person on television because I don't just uh, spew out uh, these big things and move to the next thing and work on people's short attention span and lack of critical thinking skills. Uh, and you diverted me from that again. Uh, uh, no. Uh, and then I must be an evil person because I was using the same techniques you use. I'm talking about critical thinking skills. You have got to apply that standard here. This kid. Well, no, I, let me, I, no, you're not. Because my critical thinking skills, they're not better or worse than yours. They're extremely different and surgical. And I'm the one that's supposed to be informing you on, and I, I might be a moron doctor, and so <laughs> I would give you bad information. But in general, me and you are old enough to know that we come from a different world we don't have a lawyer like we did on Fox News a couple of years ago talking to an atmospheric science postdoc in a debate about ozone layers. But we did. And the postdoc was so innocent in his approach, he actually accepted that debate. And I always, that always stuck to me about where we've come to as a nation in our value for critical thought and someone who is uh, potentially an expert or an intellectual that can actually inform us how these things should go. Uh, and uh, I'm seeing us get, and again, uh, I am absolutely with all due respect, I think you're a really nice guy and a really smart guy, but uh, 
Uh, I think you're, I mean, you are old enough to know uh, this is not the way things went 30 years ago even. Uh, I want to make a point that really puts a dent quite a bit on one small position you guys have. And I don't think you'll let me, Mac. And that's okay. Uh, and, but, but this is between you and I. Well, I'm looking at the autopsy report, which I'm familiar with. I've seen this it report before. Be. So let me, let me make a meta thing. Your saying I am familiar with is the, the whole point, what I'm saying in the nicest way. It's impossible for you to have the same type of familiarity or uh, 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 getting what I, someone like me gets out of it, who spent 17 years training in medicine and then seeing 40,000 patients at a county ER and being in the, in the uh, you know, autopsy area on a regular basis and doing this for a living. And I was going to give you my position on it. So you're not, uh, you know, my, my God, you're not familiar with it in the same way I am. It's impossible by design, even if you are Einstein. So uh, you're right. You're absolutely right. I, I, there's why no not way, let me give you there's that? There's no way that I can apply the same kind of experience level. That's why we had an independent forensics toxicologist, PhD, in this area examine this. That's why the National Institute. And that's why you won't let me give you my piece. Uh, you're good. You can finish. Examine every one of these autopsy reports, and they came to the same. I'm repeating what the experts said that match or exceed the experience level you have. That's all. I, I get it that I'm just a lay person, and you're a lot smarter than me on these kinds of issues. I understand that. I was merely quoting the results of very experienced medical professionals who examined these autopsy reports, which the FDA trotted out as their examples as to why Kratom should be viewed as this dangerous substance, and the National Institute on Drug Abuse called BS on them, and the independent toxicologist that looked at these reports did the same thing. Now, I get it that you can, you can look through a different lens here and see a problem. I see the problem. I see a way for us to deal with mental health issues. We need to do more there. I see with us a, a way that we need to look at advising people about mixing the use of Kratom with alcohol abuse and depression and other substances. I get that. But those are behavioral issues. They're certainly not regulatable in the sense of scheduling something because then you create the black market and this kid would have died just as surely as he died here searching for some kind of substance to find relief for the mental health issues that he was experiencing or his alcohol abuse that was part of his depression. So I, I understand and, I, and I, I will now be quiet and you're free to make this analysis. I was merely pointing out my familiarity was that I reviewed it from a policy perspective, relying upon the advice of very experienced medical personnel who understand these issues far better than I. But you could put all of this, uh, you could uh, put my video up and then under it, you could, you're welcome to put Bonnie Mott's an idiot because- <laughs> I would never uh, suggest such a thing. No, no, but you can because uh, I, I am absolutely confident in my positions, uh, whatever I say and I change them. And I will say this, we're looking at one report here uh, and we could spend uh, going through all of them so I can get a better picture. But I'm looking at this one report. And uh, again, to say, uh, if I was gonna look at this report as it came through. So the first comment that you made uh, is, we can't assume this guy is uh, not bought. We can, to a certain extent. Number one, I can validate it, right? Uh, I can, uh, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. In the same way, Donald Trump might say, hey, it's just an opinion. Anyone can have an opinion. Well, we can't have an opinion. The moon is made out of cheese. I guess you can, but you can't make policy out of it. In that same way, I can have an opinion. So looking at this, it's December 29th, 2014. This was not so charged back then. And more than likely, uh, as I know a lot of these guys, uh, he was just kind of making a report. I can also say that a lot of these guys uh, are very cautious in the reports they make. But I can make a reasonable assumption that he wasn't driven by anything. And if it's a really big issue where so many of these guys are driven by something and I have evidence of that, I'll pick up the phone and give him a call and get a sense for myself. So that's what I meant by that. Uh, because, you know, uh, like I said, the moon may be made out of cheese. So that's that part of it. The next part of it is, I'm going to go to this. 
uh, and you are familiar with it, but I do want, if you put this up, uh, uh, number one, the first thing I look at is 24 years old. Okay. 24-year-olds uh, don't drop dead, right? Uh, because uh, even if they're using drugs and there's all kinds of people doing that stuff, uh, you know, something is extreme when a 24-year-old drops dead. And that's the first thing I, as a clinician, look at this, okay? He has a significant history, okay, alcohol abuse and depression. All of this could cause death at 24, but again, it has to be extreme. So I'm gonna look for that extreme, right? Suicide and all that stuff. Uh, he's been drinking since 15, okay, that's significant. He's had previous suicide attempts with pills and ho hospitalized for accidental overdose. When I look at that myself, I'm very suspicious, why? because of my uh, uh, experience both uh, in county facilities with marginalized mental health populations and substance abuse populations. When I read that, it tells me quite a bit about the patient, but not enough. And here's what I mean. He's messed up. There's mental health stuff going on. But when you say to me with pills and at one accidental overdose, uh, there is a major difference in my mind suicidal gestures versus suicide attempts. I can't get any of that out of this. So I take it neither here or there, except there's a major problem here. And the one overdose was accidental, not even an attempt. That's interesting, right? It's really interesting. Because again, I'm trying to figure out why he died. Uh, his mother spoke with him by phone the night before his death, and he sounded fine. And he had no complaints. Uh, unless if I know anything more, which this report isn't going to go into that history, you know, I'm going to assume that uh, he's trying to tell me if there's something wrong and he's going to try and hurt himself, that would tell me that the mom said it sounded suspicious. But again, none of these is 100%. It's the additive and the knowledge that I have and looking at thousands of things that make me look at things this way. Uh, Less than one hour later, after his mom spoke with him, I guess, his friend picked him up from his residence and described him as appearing out of it, tired and depressed, okay? Uh, he was starting to become sedated. They drove to the friend's residence, watched television for about an hour, and during that time, the decedent reportedly consumed a glass of wine and a beer, okay? Whatever he had taken, now he's added two uh, things of alcohol to it. Uh, but nothing here is, uh, uh, as, until we know what was in his system, nothing here should kill a 24-year-old, okay? He then took a sleeping pill, still shouldn't kill him, unless if there was a bunch of stuff before, and they retired to bed at midnight. And the friend didn't think he's suicidal. At three, three hours later, the friend woke because uh, he was encroaching on his sleeping space, but could not move him and found that he was cold and unresponsive. So from midnight to three, it looks like he had probably been dead at least a couple of hours. It takes a while for rigor mortis, well, that's even longer, but for you to get cold. Uh, but uh, that's three hours later and unresponsive. He called, uh, uh, he moved him to the floor, started compressions, medics arrived seven minutes later. Uh, they uh, initiated uh, CP um, ACLS, uh, advanced cardiac life support. Uh, it was unsuccessful. So that means he was probably, if a 20 year old in seven minutes, they get there and a 24 year old that's otherwise healthy, uh, ACLS doesn't give you anything. And I'm assuming they never got any kind of rhythm. That's dead for quite a while. Okay. Vomitus was noted on the bed. All right. <clears throat> and that's sig significant for all kinds of stuff. He could not protect his airway probably, okay? Uh, which means there was enough depression there uh, that he couldn't uh, uh, protect his airway, respiratory depression. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a bottle of uh, Effexor 75. I don't know if it was extended release, which is a normal dose. Uh, Mirtazapine 15, which is a low dose. And Omeprazole 20, which is a normal dose. Uh, in fact, the pill counts from those bottles suggested that he had taken even less than prescribed. That's significant for me. Okay. Uh, 
and a loose, uh, you know, diarrhea and medication was also among his positions. Okay, uh, autopsy was performed about almost 30 hours after he was dead. So there's nothing weird on uh, why this guy would have died, and that's without knowing the toxicology. But the historical evaluation of a uh, deceased doesn't show anything that profoundly significant. And the place I would look now is we need quantitative toxicology reports that are postmodern, mortem with their limitations, okay? Uh, now we see pulmonary edema and congestion, okay? That could be from the vomitus, but usually that vomitus from uh, not being able to protect your airway doesn't necessarily cause extensive edema and congestion. Uh, and I am not all that familiar with the 950 and 890 grams because it's been a long time. So I don't have a scale of measurement, uh, but uh, sure, the vomiting can cause a little bit of that, but I don't think extensively. I have to go back and review my thoughts and talk to a colleague. Moderate urinary retention, that's weird for me. No natural disease or trauma. So again, more weird things pop up. What does he have on board, as far as we know, without a quantitative data? He has normal medication and he has two glasses of booze. We got to look at the toxicology, okay? They reported a case of death attributed to mixed drug toxicity, primarily uh, mitragynine, okay? Well, right, why did they say that? Uh, the initial screen test confirmed and quantified alcohol, Benadryl, uh, mertazapine, uh, Effexor, and o dexamethylphenolphenone, which is an antidepressant, uh, which is uh, the breakdown product of Effexor. Uh, initially detected by the alkaline drug screen were quantified. Now they get a more formal analysis of uh, the initial drug screen. Uh, and they also did an ELISA, which was negative. It's irrelevant here, non-contributory to our discussion. But that's all they have. This uh, case describes a death resulting from the use of, now they jump to their conclusion, uh, from the use of Kratom, while associated with the administration of other medications. There are other medications on board. Their normal amount no evidence, and we'll go down if they, uh, they talk, talk about it. There's really no evidence of uh, abuse, toxicity levels, or misuse. All we know is there's Kratom on board and these other medications, and the guy was drowsy at midnight. There was no historical concern for a suicide attempt. And then he was done when we found him three hours later and probably down for a couple of hours, cold, 24 years old, no significant medical history. Uh, both of the antidepressants detected, uh, there's serotonin and norepinephrine and Benadryl, uh, antihistamine, they're a very potent antagonist, okay? And that's true. Uh, it was previously concluded that the addition of the potent mu receptor agonist, O-desmethyltramadol, uh, to powered leaves from Kratom contributed to nine unintentional deaths, uh, that's not here or there. In review, all these cases, author concurs and uh, reiterate the statement, recognize that Kratom is not as harmless as it often described. And the question is, why are they saying that? It may exert potentially serious additive effects to numerous endogenous receptors with central nervous depressant activity, okay? And that's okay, I think I, now here. This is this is a critical point. The nine deaths that were reported in Sweden that are that are referenced here. It's not. Are, yeah, so I, it's not important because I'm. You know what I'm going to take. It is important. It is important because none of those nine toxicologists who reported those nine deaths independently because they were over a twelve month period were were somehow terrible people. They, they were trying this to find- This is distracting from my point, Matt. No, 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 I'm gonna take those, I'm gonna take those completely. Even the document references it, and you can't ignore it. You're distracting from my point. In fact, I'm gonna take that sentence out and we can pretend it never happened. No, it's in the document you're referencing. Dr. B, here's the point. Yeah, I'm not, the point, I'm not done. 
Matt, you're going to either let me do this okay. the right way, which you know what the right thing to do is instead of trying to promote a thought with, with potential effects on human lives, or you're going to let me do this right. So I'm going to continue, and we're going to discuss. Justin, that I'm not concerned about the effects on a human life is offensive. I am concerned about it, but we ought to be searching for the and truth. Let me, and let me for subjective opinions. Well, let me speak your objective I'm a doctor. So yeah, so yeah, because I am concerned, and I think you're distracting from the point here. And we already got off because we were really focused on the issue here. Okay, so well, you know what? We're going to take out the nine deaths. Who cares? We're not even going to talk. You about should that. care. You should care because they, they are illustrative of the point I'm making that these aren't these aren't terrible. No, your point was that it's in, no, okay. So okay, we'll leave it in. That's great, Mike. So after a comprehensive toxicology screening, the only other compounds detected were therapeutic concentrations of Effexor, Benadryl, Mirtazapine, and F ethanol. Therapeutic concentrations. Based on the circumstances, autopsy findings histology and toxicology results, the cause of death was certified due to mixed drug intoxication, primarily mitragynine. And so, you know, in fact, they're being, uh, uh, they're not being very, uh, 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 they're not really pushing, hey, they're being very clear about it, is we don't know much about this drug, but those drugs aren't going to kill you. We do know, and we know everything in his system. All those drugs were at a therapeutic level. We had one additional thing, and I'm gonna make a point about this mixed thing. Uh, despite the detection of other compounds of therapeutic concentrations, they were uh, considered to have additive toxic central nervous system effect to the presence of mitragynine, and the manner of death was certified as accident. Uh, he did have a history of suicide, substance abuse, prior accidental overdose. He just had a, the kid had a bad uh, uh, behavioral disposition uh, uh, and he had available much more medicine should he have intended to overdose or die. Therefore, the manner of death was an accident. Fair enough. Uh, this is a big deal for the nerdy pathology type, central blood to peripheral blood ratio and the liver ratio. I, I would have to relook those up to try and interpret them and it's not... I don't have the qualifications to make an extensive commentary on that that would affect my position and human life on this, so I won't. These ratios suggest no potential for mitragynine postmortem redistribution. Oh yeah, I remember what these are. These numbers are an academic discussion among the pathologist type in regards to the toxic substance or drug distribution given lack of mobility and gravity and blood circulation and what its value means when they collect it. And so they're introducing that. I don't know what, uh, I don't have enough details to make an academic comment about it, but they seem to think that it doesn't fall within their world. Uh, and there's a model they're using and I don't know what it means because it's not my world. Uh, however, as this deduction results from a single authorization, it should be viewed with caution. Very fair, academically fair, ethically fair. The present case describes the distribution of post-mortem mitragynin concentrations in a case where it was determined to contribute to death with therapeutic con concentrations of all the other drugs. Uh, and then it goes on uh, how it was confirmed. Uh, and... Uh, 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 whatever I say, the thing, and uh, anything else. My, and, and so when you look at that, the very idea, uh, let's say this was a wonderful drug. The very idea, if we were to extrapolate from this one case, which would be wrong, but there's dozens like this. The very idea to say, let's give this stuff, let's just say all the comments you made, Mac, uh, we can discuss them ad nauseum. I'm going to concentrate on one thing because that's what I personally do for my living is break things down. Uh, if this is an issue, and we have dozens of cases like this by the National Kratom Advocates Association, people that argue for this, uh, hey, it's all poly substance. If there's dozens of this across the world, the very idea that we have a substance and we don't know which other drugs it could potentially mix badly with, with 
and cause sedation overdose is an absolute reason to stop advocating for this drug yesterday without further studies, control, and dissemination of the right information. So I don't uh, have an interest in uh, uh, the regulatory FDA, this, that. I'm just talking about the way something should be chopped up, looked at, and evaluated. And uh, that's what I want. And we can go, with, uh, we can spend four days going through all of right. it. So, so the, the, I think the broader issue here is that, and, and, and I understand exactly the concern that you've identified here uh, and appreciate it. By the way, the Kratom community did not make up the word poly drug use or the phrase. I didn't say they did. I no, said no, no, but you say it's repeated a lot. And, and the reason it's repeated is it's the conclusion that was no. drawn by the National no. Institute of Drug Abuse about Kratom and an, evalu an independent evaluation of the deaths reported by the FDA associated with Kratom, of which this case is one of them. Yes, and that's why said, there's no reason for us. Wait, guys, so, Matt. Um, let me finish my point. I, I do not respect your time. So, there's so that's, there's no point that. in me. We cannot demonize the Kratom community for saying that the conclusion that was found by the National Institute on Drug Abuse about Kratom deaths were that they were attributable to, in, in, in some cases, poly drug use. That's the term used by the National Institute, Institute on Drug Abuse. But here, I think, is the more salient point to no, your... Let me answer that. I didn't say that. Number one, I didn't demonize them. And you actually, again, uh, move, I'm going to address that. Uh, you said demonize. I didn't demonize them. I said, and we do know that these guys, uh, uh, they're, they're taking a term from the toxicology report and they're using it. We know that. That's a fact, but without any discussion around the narrative of reality. What they're doing is saying, hey, it was poly substances and not kratom. That's how they're using it, and that's wrong. So that, I want to clarify that. There was no demonization, and I'm absolutely right. They're, you, so, so what? It could have been God that came up with the term, but the way they're using it is that uh, the point of that argument that they make is that Kratom is safe. And I just countered your entire argument that using the concept of Kratom was always attributed to polypharmacy overdoses and therefore Kratom is safe is wrong. And you just came back and threw something in there to actually uh, dismiss my, uh, my entire presentation was for that. So please go on. So, so I, I was trying to use the truth in terms of the with the characterization of a poly drug use and where that phrase was applied, whether it's misapplied by some in the Kratom community is a fair argument. But this, I think, is the more salient point. All of the information that is, that is evident here in this case and in the 43, uh, well, 42 other cases, because one of them uh, was completely off. The, there was no blood report to justify it. Of those 43 deaths, what we found are cases where, in the instance where the decedent was using other substances, what we should apply is the method that we use in the Food and Drug Administration evaluation of contraindicated substances and use that model. And what they do is when they get a report, an adverse event report, particularly related to a fatality, they evaluate what was the prescription drug that was taken and what was the suspect substance that contributed to the death. And if they determine through a cluster of deaths in an adverse event reporting system that flags when you get a significant number, they then go to the prescription drug over which the FDA has specific regulatory authority and they put a black box warning on those drugs. So for example, in, in this particular case, you would say that, that a black box warning might be, might be appropriate to say that if you are using this drug, you should not concurrently use the dietary supplement, even if they want to go that far, if they don't want to call it a food, metrogeny. They could say that. And that's exactly the way the system works today. But instead, the FDA wants to go to the extreme position and say, because there are multiple uh, substances involved in the decedent death in 40, well, 43 cases, then therefore Kratom should be called a drug and therefore should be scheduled. That is an incorrect policy statement. It is not founded in the science and it does not meet the criteria that's required 
in the Controlled Substances Act, which wasn't plucked out of thin air. It was oh. based on good scientific and doctors like yourselves advising. You're adding again, uh, I, I have to, uh, again, I'm, I'm slow. So I got to uh, respond to one thing instead of uh, uh, eight, nine, 10 claims at a time. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I'll go back and respond to your claim, which has a good argument, actually. Uh, Thank you. you uh, the first claim, the rest of them, I mean, I get lost after eight or nine. Uh, these are great for debate. I never took a debate class, uh, but, I, but uh, I, I am well versed in uh, linguistics and math in, some, in those areas. Uh, uh, you made a claim that uh, uh, it is the onus of uh, the FDA or whoever it is to put a warning label on the drugs that this stuff is mixed with. That's uh, the way the system works, yes. Right, so yeah. So uh, I'm not, uh, so a few thoughts on that. For example, cheese, cheese and mal inhibitors. You could get really sick, okay? Uh, and it would be silly for the FDA to go put a label on cheese. Uh, Amen, for, uh, Amen. Uh, but it, it would except uh, a few things, okay? Uh, Kratom is not cheese. Uh, number one, you said that's the way the system works. What's different? What's different, Dr. V? Kratom, the cheese hits the same U opioid receptor in the brain as Kratom does. What's different? They're both foods. What's different? They both have alkaloid contents that have different effects on sectors of the brain. What's different? Except that we want to call them different. That's what the FDA does. That's what you're doing. I get it. Uh, I don't care about the F. So, uh, but, but you didn't... Uh, so now the, the discussion about the semantics of food versus drug, uh, I would say uh, it's so off center and not applicable in this case that we, we could reserve that entire discussion for two hours of why that is uh, just almost a ploy uh, by whoever's using this. And I don't mean you, I mean that position. No, I'm using it. I, I think Kratom is a food. It is not a drug. The FDA has, has used the mischaracterization of Kratom, calling it a drug, an unapproved drug, for their own reg selfish regulatory purposes, the same way they tried to demonize dietary supplements, which today, by the way, is $53 billion industry, employing tens of thousands of Americans. But more importantly, more than 70% of the American public uses dietary supplements and vitamins in their daily lives to improve their health and well-being. We think that Kratom should be available to those people as well to make intelligent, informed decisions over a properly regulated product. You I don't think we disagree if we would just come to the right terminology. No, I, I actually, you know, you, you bring up this dietary industry uh, and, and then you brought up something else really interesting. Uh, people making educated, well-informed decisions I'm going to argue that that's stolen from them long time ago. And uh, that, that's uh, uh, because uh, uh, whether it's an advocacy group or a company trying to sell stuff. Or, or the FDA uh, or the FDA trying to, to strip them of their freedom. Maybe uh, them. Well, well, I'm not talking about freedom. Uh, and I don't think the FDA has a bunch of, so I am absolutely not pro FDA, DEA, anything. Uh, but I'm going to tell you this, there's no conspiracy, whether it's your advocacy group or a company selling Kratom or a company selling Suboxone, which I'm the king of. Every single one of them is driven by the same thing, greed and power. Okay. That I, be, I disagree with you strongly. There, there is a bias that is embedded in the policy division of the FDA against all dietary supplements and plants. It is clear. They are all for everything being a new drug application. And if that were not true, if it were not true, the Congress would not have had to step in and enact the DeShay Act unanimously to tell the FDA to go pound sand. Because if the FDA had their way, there would be no no dietary supplement or vitamin industry in America. So do not tell me there's not a conspiracy. There is not just not a conspiracy. There is a concerted effort, regulatory effort, to ban substances that the American people ought to be able to freely use of their own volition in order to improve their health and well-being by their own choice, as long as those substances are not unsafe and as long as they are properly regulated. You cannot tell me that the FDA acts completely with high morals and ethics in this no, area. No, they don't. I didn't, I didn't tell you that. They, you they, told me there was no conspiracy out there. Uh, 
well, no. of course there is. No, no. There is a concerted effort. I said the cons if you want to call it conspiracy, that's fine. You called it a conspiracy. You said there's no conspiracy out there, and I'm telling you there is. There is a concerted effort, a conspiracy by any definition, to block all plant and dietary supplements. And if they had their way, they would ban the Deshay Act, they would repeal the Deshay Act and force all dietary supplements and plants to go through the new drug application process. And do you know why? Because they know that they wouldn't make it there. There's not an investor that's willing to go out and to pay the $5 billion and spend 10 years studying something that's not patentable. And the FDA knows it. It is a cynical game that they play. And to suggest that there is not a bias that is embedded deeply in the FDA simply is not consistent with the facts or the history of the behavior of the FDA. And the bias is, I mean, look, like I told you, uh, their bias is no more moral. Well, actually, you're going to find guys probably in the FDA with more ethical standards than you're going to find guys in industry, including those dietary supplements. Uh, and since we keep bringing that up, uh, I, I should make myself real clear on that. Uh, for the most part, uh, that is a, a industry of sugar pills where, with potential harm. Uh, uh, pretty much all of the stuff uh, has no, pretty much, pretty much most of that $50 billion a year industry is useless and does nothing for the person and potentially does them harm. Uh, so that's my position. We can respectfully disagree on that point. I think that the science would prove that you're wrong on that, but that's, that's irrespective. The, the, point, the point I make is that you suggested that there was no grand conspiracy at the FDA against the dietary sub, or in this case, the creative industry, and there is. There is a deeply embedded philosophy that has been evidenced time and time again. I served as the chief of staff of the Department of Health and Human Services in the Reagan administration, which dates me, by the way. I'm, I'm 70 years old. When I and I was a young man when I was there. And while I was there, one of the issues that arose was this, this attack by the FDA on the Herbalife uh, company because they were selling these, these weight reduction products uh, that were uh, on a multi-level marketing. And the FDA hated it. Now, with good reason, by the way, because- They shut those, down. No, they're not. They're, what do you mean they shut down? They're in business today. Go are do they still around? Yes, they, of course they are. And you know why? because the FDA was wrong. And what they did is they came with testimony to Senator Roth's committee about Herbalife and the FDA presented the testimony to me and that was my role as chief of staff and they attributed seven deaths to Herbalife supplement products. That's right, said, I remember let me, that. Let me see the autopsies. And do you know what the autopsy showed? Their best case. I asked Frank Young, commissioner of the FDA, show me your best one first. It was a, it was a, a woman that was morbidly obese in Florida who was told by her doctor that she had to lose, uh, I think, 60 pounds. And she had a friend that was in the, uh, the multi-level marketing program at Herbalife. And she told her, well, you should buy Herbalife products and you can lose 40 pounds in three months. This woman did two things. One, she said, I can uh, quadruple the dose of Herbalife products and I can lose the weight in one month which is what the doctor told her she had to start doing to lose weight. And secondly, she stopped taking her cardiac medication. A morbidly obese 400 plus pound woman stopped taking her cardiac medicine and died of a heart attack two weeks later. And the FDA wanted to stand up in front of the United States Congress and say it was because of an Herbalife product. It was not. It was because this woman, for whatever reason, decided, and it wasn't a very good decision, decided to quit taking her cardiac medication. I said, okay, Frank, give me the second one. We have seven deaths. Second was a kid, a 19-year-old kid in New Orleans who stepped off the curb and got hit by a bus. And I said, how in the world are you going to claim that that's attributable to Herbalife products? They said, well, he was, he was dieting and he was lightheaded and he wasn't paying attention. This is what the FDA does. And no one on, on God's green earth will convince me that the FDA doesn't have this embedded bias that is still present and prevalent in the FDA because in 1990, 20 or 15, 20 years later, they were up there again saying to everybody, let's ban all dietary supplements. Let's make them do drug applications. And today- Why did it have them. this bias? I mean, I'm not saying it should. I mean, look, uh, again, uh, when, uh, I, I think you misunderstood when I said 
there's no conspiracy. There is no conspiracy anywhere. It's not, uh, the conspiracy is just tragedy of the human condition is uh, we are uh, uh, prone to greed. And that's a conspiracy. Okay. Okay. That's, that's a great point. So Dr. B, here's the greed. In the PDUFA Act, when it was passed, the Pres Prescription Drug User Fee Act, it was done because the Congress was simply not able to fund the FDA to give them the equipment and personnel that they claimed that they needed in order to approve new drug applications. So under the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, they gave, the Congress gave the PDUFA, which, which said the drug companies had to pay for the equipment and personnel in return for a specific timetable for reviews. The whole idea was to accelerate, not to put unsafe drugs on the market, but simply to give them the equipment that was necessary to speed up the reviews to come to a determination. In the first, after the first two years of the Padoop Act, 9% of the CEDAR budget was, being, uh, was, was uh, being infused into the CEDAR budget. So that was great. And today it's over 60%. So is it any wonder why the FDA doesn't want to deal with the dietary supplement industry, which do not pay user fees, or Kratom, which will not pay user fees? They are biased to follow the money. It's greed. You said it perfectly. This is a problem that we've got to simply weed out from the current, the current inherent biases that are built in to the way that reviews are done at the FDA. Now, that's a larger, more systemic problem, but it doesn't discount the fact that the FDA staff today ignores the science. If they were right, if the FDA were right about Kratom, the DA would have snapped their fingers and they would have executed on a, a scheduling recommendation because I, trust me, the DA people aren't in the business of killing people. They're in the business of protecting the American citizens. And today, the, three years after the full eight factor analysis was provided by the FDA, making the best case known to man why Kratom should be scheduled, it is today not scheduled. The US Congress has put report language in their appropriations bill saying don't ban Kratom to actually study it. You have the National Institutes on Drug Abuse Director, Nora Volko, who testified under oath when asked by the House Appropriations Committee, should we ban Kratom? She said, no, we're seeing too many. And listen to this, Dr. B, anecdotal reports Thousands of anecdotal reports of people are saying they're benefited from it. And in the midst of this opioid crisis, why wouldn't we reduce the harm? That's the bottom line here. And I know we've, we've gone long here and, and, I, and I've actually got to jump on a call in six minutes, but I got to tell you, the bottom line here is that I think you and I have commonality in most of the areas we would probably come to an agreement. But the one thing that we are going to disagree on is what is the appropriate regulatory scheme for Kratom? We believe that it should be treated as a food. It ought to be properly regulated, that you should not be allowed to adulterate it or synthesize its alkaloids, which will change its therapeutic or its pharmacologic effects. It should be not sold to, to uh, minors, and it should be manufactured under good manufacturing standards so you eliminate uh, heavy metals and, and potential contaminants like salmonella and E. coli. We believe in that. That's what we advocate for. We want safe Kratom products available to the American public. In the area where there are people that are using Kratom as an alternative to, uh, for acute and chronic pain patients, which you're allowed to do as American citizens, use anything that works for you, for those people using it, not allowing a Kratom vendor to say a therapeutic claim is a part of the sale of it because that's illegal, but if a citizen says, I'm going to use it for this purpose, and there are thousands and thousands that do, and it helps them, we should allow for safe Kratom products to be marketed so that they can have access as a harm reduction measure to what is the most awful crisis we have in America today with tens of thousands of Americans dying because we have, we have a, an opioid crisis that was fueled largely by the complete dereliction of duty by the Food and Drug Administration. And that's the tragedy that we're confronted with today. And because they want to cover their, their malfeasance and malpractice in the regulatory arena by coming down hard on a product like Kratom simply is, it makes no sense. I, I welcome the opportunity to come back and talk to you again. We can drill more into this. I respect the position that you have. I don't think that the Kratom community should be critical of your positions and certainly should not be do so in a way that is any way derisive. I think that we can find a common agreement on many of these things and agree to disagree on others. At the bottom line, I think the FDA ought to be looking closely at any adverse events that are related to drug interactions where a person is taking a prescription drug and using Kratom at the same time because that's what we should be watching for. We should advise against that. 
We tell people all the time that you should do it carefully. We advocate for more science and that you should, you should consult your doctor. And in a, a recent study that was done by Oliver Grunman and his team, 40% of the people that are using Craven today consult their doctor about its use. Now, most of the time, doctors don't know what they're talking about, but people are learning about it. And as people learn about it, its use increases. And that's why we ought to have a good regulatory scheme. So that's my pitch. I deeply appreciated the time you've given me here tonight to, for us to have an exchange of viewpoints. I respect the fact that you have far more experience than I. In oh, the that's not the issue, Mark. I really enjoy this. Listen, uh, uh, before, uh, uh, let me just say this. So my, uh, my only position on Kratom that I want to, everyone to understand is that uh, the, the substance, the natural substance, absolutely has uh, potential for vast therapeutic benefits. It needs extensive research because my position is that research is actually not there. And then it needs uh, regulation where people shouldn't make a decision. So that's all I have to say on that. Well, great, great. Well, thank you again.